Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 465. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Anzalone. A lot of news to get through on today's show, so just a quick reminder to share the show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, or Odyssey for the video version of the show. You can find it anywhere you listen to audio podcasts, and you can follow the show uh, by just subscribing to me or following me on Twitter at Kyle Anzalone underscore. All right, everybody, let's get into the news today. The first story I have for the Libertarian Institute here, Pentagon to develop drone swarms for war with China. The Department of Defense is developing the ability to launch thousands of drones at the same time for use in a future war with China, according to top Pentagon officials. At a conference hosted by the National Defense Industrial Association, NDIA, Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hitz said Washington is launching a program that aims to be able to launch thousands of land, air, and sea drones simultaneously. She said at the conference, uh, they can be used consistent with our principles of mission command where we empower the lowest possible echelons to innovate and succeed in battle. Uh, She remarked that the drone program Uh, And they can serve as a resilient distribution systems, even if the bandwidth is limited, intermediate, degraded, or denied. Uh, An admiral, the head of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, discussed deploying as many as a thousand drones within 24 hours. Here's a metric for me. A thousand targets for 24 hours, he said. Hits said the numbers can be scaled from thousands to higher numbers in the future. We'll also aim to replicate and uh, inculcate how we achieve that goal so we can scale whatever relevant in the future again and again and again. Easier said than done, you bet, but we're going to do it, uh, he said. Uh, The Admiral explained research for the weapon systems is already underway through DARPA, that's D-A-R-P-A. The components in Indopacom have been experiencing now for the last five to ten years with many of those unmanned capabilities. Those will be an asymmetric advantage, so operational concepts that we are working through are going to help amplify our advantages in this theater there's a term hellscape that we use in recent conflicts, Ukraine, Nagorno Karabakh and Ethiopia, small drones have played a large role on the battlefield. Washington in the midst of a massive military buildup in the Indo-Pacific provoking a potential war with Beijing over Chinese territorial claims to Taiwan and the South China sea. President Joe Biden and his two predecessors have invested billions of dollars in developing and deploying more weapons near China's borders while investing little effort in diplomacy. The American policy of relying on military aggression over talks has sunk the Washington and Beijing relationship to a historic low point. All right, next up, we're going to get to the war in Ukraine And this is really crazy, although as crazy as this story is, it's actually been the policy for some time. So Biden looks to prevent future president from ending Ukraine war. The Biden administration is working to reach a deal with Ukraine for long term military support to keep backing the war with Russia. That would be difficult for a future president president to exit, the Wall Street Journal reported. The effort is a part of a commitment made by G7 nations at the NATO summit in Vilnius to negotiate their own bilateral security deals with Ukraine. Besides G7 nations, 18 other countries have agreed to provide long-term support uh, to Kiev. The idea of long-term commitment is to show the Russia that it can't wait out the Biden administration. The journal report reads, Western officials are looking for ways to lock in pledges out uh, pledges of support and limit future governments' abilities to backtrack amid fears in European capitals that Donald Trump, if he recaptured the White House, would seek to scale back aid. And so, 
this shouldn't be the, the way American foreign policy works, that essentially uh, a president can start a war and then when an election comes up where the American people then actually have a say on that war, he basically prevents that president from exiting. However, you know, this is essentially how the, the situation has been in Ukraine uh, for the past five years eight years now. Uh, if you look at what happened when Donald Trump was impeached the first time, you know, the, the narrative was, is that he wanted the Ukrainians to investigate Joe Biden. And so he leveraged uh, aid to Ukraine, military weapons to Ukraine uh, to get that investigation. Now, we could get into the, the truth of all that, but I, I don't think that's important. I think what is important is what was said during the testimony of that impeachment trial. And that was, you know, Democrats are calling witnesses forward, including Fiona Hill, who were saying that, look, as president, Donald Trump does not have the right. He does not have the power. He does not have the ability to change American policy. It is the establishment policy, the establishment foreign policy to provide arms to Ukraine and doing so in their view weakens America and is therefore not acceptable to change that policy. And that is why Donald Trump was impeached for the first time. Now, uh, so, so in a way, you know, this is basically just the policy that that Joe Biden is looking to uh, more permanently enshrine, maybe. But in reality, this is again something that has existed for quite some time. Uh, that it, it's being blatantly done and talked about in the the Wall Street Journal is. I think the shocking part about it uh, and that it doesn't upset more Americans, you, you know, this should be one of those stories where people kind of wake up and realize that something doesn't smell right here. Like something is actually wrong with this policy. If the American people were finally able to vote on it, voted against it. And then the, the, you know, previous president basically prevented the U S um, from being able to do anything now, you, you know, the, here's the other part that that's always interesting, too, uh, is that it seems that president's hands could only be tied when it comes to ending a war. So, for example, you know, Trump exited the Iran deal uh, during his time as president, even though uh, Iran was complying with that deal as far as, you, you know, the deal between uh, the Iranians and the Americans, Tehran and Washington, that was signed during the Obama deal. But Trump just left it anyways. And, and it, it happened. It, it, you know, the world kept going. But when you have something like this, where you, you got a president trying to end a war, well, then, you know, that that policy is permanent. Then we can't touch that policy. So the only policies that could change are the ones that that move us towards war. All right. So let's talk now. The U.S. announced a two hundred and fifty million dollar arms package for Ukraine yesterday. Uh, the Biden administration on Tuesday announced a new two hundred and fifty million dollar arms package for Ukraine that includes HIMAR ammunition AIM-9 missiles, artillery rounds, and various types of other equipment. The $250 million package is being paid for using funds made available by an <laughs> accounting error. The Pentagon claimed that it overvalued arms that it had been sending to Ukraine, freeing up an additional $6.2 billion to spend on fueling the proxy war against Russia. And the, the first arms package using these funds was announced on August 24th. I believe this is the second. And so these are PDA funds. That's the Presidential Drawdown Authority, where the U.S. is just sending arms directly out of our stockpiles to the Ukrainians. Just uh, to run through a quick list of what is in this arms package. AIM-9M AIM missiles for air defenses, additional ammunition for HIMARS, 155mm and 105mm artillery rounds. It doesn't specify if those are cluster or uh, conventional artillery rounds. Mind clearing equipment, tow missiles, javelin and other anti-armor rockets, Hydra 70 rockets, over 3 million rounds of small arms ammunition, armored medical treatment vehicles, and high mobility multi purpose wheeled vehicles and oh, wheeled ambulances. 
And then demolition munitions for obstacle clearing, spare parts, maintenance, and other field equipment. So pretty substantial list. It's not the largest arms package we've seen. That they've been in the billions of dollars recently, but uh, nonetheless, you, you know, this is going to fuel uh, the conflict for another couple of weeks until the Biden administration announces the Ned's arms package to Ukraine. They should have a few billion dollars left after they came up with that accounting error to to keep the the funding going. Uh, my guess is that th they're going to really press and say that the reason Congress has to pass the NSA package immediately is because these these weapons are, are dwindling and they're going to need to send more. And so that's uh, going to be, I think, the White House's play to really try to prevent any debate uh, over the, the current arms package. All right, here we go. Ned's story here, Dave DeCamp, antiwar.com, August 29th. Drones target western Russian city near Estonian border. This this could be a major provocation. It, it could be maybe overblown or something misreported at this point. So uh, let's get into the details here. Russian authorities said early Wednesday morning that drones targeted an airport in Peskov, a uh, Russian city about 20 miles from NATO's e member Estonia's border that's over 400 miles from Ukraine. So the governor of the Peskov Oblast wrote on Telegram that Russian Defense Ministry was repelling a drone attack on the region's airport. He said that there were no casualties in the attack based on preliminary information. According to Russia's TASS news agency, emergency services said that four IL-76 transport planes were damaged in the attack. As a result of the drone attack, four IL-76 aircraft were damaged, a fire broke out, and two planes burst into flames. According to RT, the Russian Defense Ministry also reported the drone attacks are reported separated drone attacks in a different region of Russia. This region actually borders Ukraine. Ukraine and uh, another region near that one. Over the past month, Ukrainian drone attacks inside Russia has significantly escalated. On Sunday, the Washington Post reported American officials expect the operations to increase even more. So the the question, of course, is, is if you look at a map here, it would seem that this uh, region, the, the attack in the Peskov region in, in particular, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing that it is spelled P-S-K-O-V. And again, this is near the Estonian border. And if you're in Ukrainian territory, you're likely going to have to not only fly over Russian territory, but Belarusian uh, airspace as well to, to get to this, you know, northern region of Russia that is, you know, far closer to, to the Baltic Sea than to the Black Sea. And so you wonder if Ukraine has the capability uh, to conduct a, a drone strike like that on Russian territory. Um, I guess other possibilities that don't involve Estonia's uh, involvement in this attack would be if Ukraine somehow launched launch these strikes from maybe the Baltic Sea or some body of water. I, I'm really not sure. And the, I guess the other possibility is Russia is misreporting this or that was some kind of internal strife within russia I, I mean that seems unlikely but it is important to, to look at those possibilities especially when we're talking about something like this where if these drones did come from estonia then uh i think russia is going to view this as a, a nato attack on russia which would likely mean war between nato and russia and, and that's such a a bad thing and, and of course would likely lead to nuclear conflict pretty quickly all right, so report, Ukrainian drone attacks inside Russia use Western intelligence, and this is what makes it all the more concerning and provocative. The Economist reported on Sunday that Ukraine's increasing drone attacks inside Russia are carried out using intelligence gathered by Kiev's Western backers. The report cited sources close to Ukrainian drone developers and Ukrainian military insiders, including a drone coordinator within Ukraine's military intelligence. It detailed the planning that goes into the drone attacks, which involves gathering intelligence on Russia's air defenses. Operators launch 
in the early mornings when defenders' concentration might be lapsing and use an order of attack designed to keep air defenses busy. They gather intelligence, often from Western partners, about radars, electronic warfare, and air defense assets, the report reads. Since Ukraine has significantly stepped up its drone attacks inside Russia, Biden administration officials have insisted that the U.S. does not encourage or enable those operations. The report contradicts these claims as the U.S. is leading Western support of uh, of Ukraine's war against Russia. So the Washington Post uh, columnist David Ignatius reported on Sunday that the U.S. is expecting Ukrainian drone attacks on Russia to increase even more. He described the flurry, uh, a flurry of 42 drones that targeted Crimea on Friday as a foretaste of what is ahead. And so, you know, you do also wonder if as the U.S. is developing these drone swarm technologies for China, if they're maybe using Ukraine as a little bit of a weapons lab to test some of that technology to see how uh, effective these drone swarms can be and what they need to do to, you know, say counter Russian um, electronic air defense systems and and also physical air defense systems. I'm sure they are developing physical air defense systems to take out, you know, these these smaller drones as well as you know, the, the bigger ones and, and missiles and, and things like that, that they already have air defenses for. So uh, the comment said that one purpose of the drone attacks, which involves targeting residential buildings in Moscow, is to have a psychological impact on ordinary Russians not affected by the war, meaning they're purposely targeting civilians. When Ukrainian attacks on Moscow first became more frequent last month, a spokesperson for the Ukrainian Air Force said that now that the war is affecting those who were not concerned, uh, said that the war is now affecting those who were not concerned. Zelensky said that the war is returning to Russia's symbolic centers. The Ukrainian military intelligence sources told The Economist that the drone attacks also target military sites such as Russian air bases. We respond to appeals from our brigades. They tell us that they know where Russia's arms are being stored, but they have no way of hitting them. They plead with us to help, the source said. So, uh, again, you know, very provocative and could definitely lead to a war or dread war between NATO and Russia uh, sometime in the not too distant future if this is kept up. All right. Poland and Baltic states demand Belarus and spell Wagner fighters. NATO members Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are demanding Belarus and spell Wagner fighters who went to the country after Pergozin's short-lived mutiny in June. Uh, This is a statement from the Polish interior minister. We have asked the regime of Belarusian president Alexander Lukashenko to immediately expel the Wagner group from Belarus. According to AFP, Lukashenko said Belarus will host 10,000 members of the Russian mercenary force. Thousands. uh, So this is what um, uh, uh, the Okay, this is the Polish interior minister. Sorry about that. Uh, They said thousands, some of whom are criminals freed from Russian prisons in return for a promise to fight in Ukraine, are deeply demoralized and accused against crimes of humanity. Now, you know, one interesting thing about this is the NATO, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia in particular, have really advocated for NATO moving uh, further and further east and deploying more and more military assets further and further east. And when Russia has complained about this, the response from NATO has been, well, you don't get to complain about where our troops are. And now that there's Russian forces essentially in Belarus, uh, the, the NATO countries are complaining. And my guess from Russia is going to be, well, you really don't get to complain where our troops are either. All right, let's move on to some news about China. This I wrote for the Libertarian Institute on August 28th, U.S. China to establish new trade communication channels. A little bit of good news on today's show. All right. 
During a visit to China, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo and her Chinese counterpart agreed to establish new communication lines to discuss trade policy. She emphasized that the channels are aimed at transparency, not normalizing relations with Beijing. The U.S. and China made the deal to set up new communication forums during a meeting between Raimondo and Chinese Commerce Minister Wang Wentao. Uh, a U.S. official said the new channels will allow Washington to inform Beijing on how to follow American tariff and trade restrictions. Uh, this is what Raimondo said after the meeting. The channels are meant to be a dialogue where we increase transparency and we are clear about what we are doing. I want to be clear that we are not compromising or negotiating on matters of national security. Raimondo, who is in China for a four-day trip and traveling with American business representatives, explained U.S. business asked her to create the lines of communication. She went on to emphasize the importance of U.S.-Chinese trade. The world is counting on the U.S. and China to responsibly maintain our commercial relationship, Raimondo said. However, Presidents Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden have imposed sweeping trade restrictions, tariffs, sanctions, and other economic penalties on Beijing over the past decade. Concurrently, Washington has engaged in the largest military buildup since World War II in countries surrounding China. Washington's aggressive military and trade policy has caused its relationship with Beijing to plummet to historic lows. Additionally, the Joe Biden administration officials, including the president, have routinely mishandled diplomacy with China, often creating unnecessary tensions and you know, examples here that I linked to are early in the administration, uh, there was a meeting between American and Chinese officials in China. There was an agreement prior to that meeting between the two sides not to criticize each other on human rights ground. The U.S. opened up its dialogue with China by criticizing the China Beijing on human rights grounds. And so the, the meeting turned into a shouting match. I also linked to two articles by Joe Biden. The first one from 2001, where he was criticizing George Bush for saying that American forces were uh, going to defend Taiwan. And then another one where President Joe Biden says American forces would defend Taiwan. All right. Raimondo's visit may be an opportunity to reverse the downward spiraling U.S.-China ties. In a press release, Beijing described the talks as constructive. Uh, the, the press release said uh, from China said the two sides had a rational, candid and constructive communication on the China-U.S. trade, economic relations and issues of mutual concern. Any diplomatic progress will likely face immediate roadblocks. Raimondo emphasized emphasized that Washington is unwilling to take any steps it claims threaten U.S. national security, while Wang said that the overgeneralization of national security is not conductive to normal trade and economic exchanges, and that unilateral and protectionist measures, which are inconsistent with market rules and the principles of fair competition, will only disturb the security and stability of of global industrial and supply chains. And so, you, again, it's not necessarily a particularly positive or constructive story, but the fact that there are talks happening between the U.S. and China and there are new lines of communication being established is positive, even if the Washington makes it very clear that they're not even considering at all a little bit de-escalating the situation with Beijing. All right, next up here, Philippines, Australia plan to conduct joint patrols in the South China Sea. The Philippines and Australia plan to conduct joint maritime patrols in the South China Sea's disputed waters that are increasingly becoming a potential flashpoint between the U.S. and China. General Romeo Brawler Jr., commander of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, said Sunday that the plans have been approved 
by the Philippines president, Marcos Jr., and the Australian government. We are still planning the details, but in essence, the Joy Patrol has been approved by the president and the Australian leadership. This is to ensure that we maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific, especially the rules-based international order, which isn't really what the Philippines is defending. They're just defending their own territorial claims in the South China Sea that, again, overlap with the Chinese claims. Even if the Chinese claims are uh, maybe more ambitious or uh, a larger overset than the Philippines claims, uh, joint patrols could put Australian vessels into dangerous situations with the Chinese Coast Guard as the Philippines and China often have tense standoffs near the disputed reefs. In the most recent incident, a Chinese vessel briefly blocked Philippines boats from resupplying a grounded ship on the Second Thomas Shoal, which is a part of the Spratly Islands. And this is really important to highlight because this is really what we're talking about here. We're talking about small reefs that are, you know, close to the surface are just breached the surface of the South China Sea. And these places are so inhospitable that rather than, you know, building some structures on them, they just beach shifts on, on these, you know, reefs. And then they claim, oh, now the Philippines have an outpost on the second time is shoal. And so this is Philippines territory. And hey, look, all this water between this shoal and the Philippines is now our territorial water. And so as you know, Know, the water three or 12 or however many miles around the shoal and uh this also means that we have you know the whole geologic structure that makes up the spratly islands uh that are a part of the second thomas shoal and then we have the the exclusive right to fish these waters and so that that's really what this is it's just uh trying to control the territory for economic gain and the u.s is just trying to really you know do anything it can uh to be confrontational with china at this point all right next up news on the korean peninsula i wrote this for the libertarian institute on august 29th uh kim jong-un washington's frantic actions risk nuclear war the Democrat People's Republic of Korea, that's DPRK, the official name for North Korea, uh, the supreme leader of that country, Kim Jong-un, slammed the U.S., Japan, and South Korea for conducting war games in the waters around the Korean Peninsula. During a speech celebrating the formation of Pyongyang's navy, Kim said that Washington's actions had become more frantic and could cause a nuclear war. Uh, this is uh, a part of his address that was given on Tuesday. The U.S. imperialists are getting more frantic than ever before in the joint naval military exercises with their vassal forces in the waters around North Korea, while putting the deployment of reinforced nuclear strategic assets in the waters around the Korean Peninsula on a permanent basis. Kim directed his ire at a recent trilateral agreement between Tokyo So and Washington. President Biden hosted his South Korean and Japanese counterparts at Camp David and into deal to conduct additional military deals drills. Referring to the PAT, Kim said the game bosses of the U.S., Japan, and the Republic of Korea were closeted with each other. They where they announced that they would construct on a regular basis the tripartite joint military exercises under different code names and said about its implementation. He added that increased military activity in the region pro provoked risk provoking a nuclear war. Owing to the reckless confrontational moves of the U.S. and other hostile forces, the wars off the Korean Peninsula have been reduced to the world's biggest war hardware concentration spot, the most unstable waters with the most danger of nuclear war, he remarked. Tensions between Washington and Pyongyang have spiraled during the Joe Biden presidency. Since taking office, Biden has refused to speak with the North Koreans on terms acceptable to Pyongyang, Further, the White House has worked to increase military ties between South Korea and Japan. Additionally, Washington has deployed several nuclear assets to the Korean Peninsula. And so I've talked about this a lot on the show, but I think it's really important to, to continue to highlight this because the, the policy that the Biden administration has towards North Korea is really reacting to Pyongyang's reactions 
towards Biden's China policy. And so, again, if you look at China, that this massive country, and then you look at North Korea, this very small, uh, you know, country on, on this, you know, small peninsula, they, they control the northern half of it uh, that borders Russia and China. Uh, if you're conducting a massive military buildup against China, any country that is, you know, very small and near China and also hostile to the U.S. is going to feel as though that military buildup could not only be used against China, but could be used against North Korea. And so North Korea has reacted harshly to that, carried out missile test war games and things like that. And so the U.S. has responded by carrying out more missile test war games, deploying nuclear assets to the Korean Peninsula and further provoking Pyongyang into conducting more you know military tests and, and things like that and so if there was anybody with any diplomatic sense at all in washington they would try to realize this and really engage in intense discussions with north korea to see you, you to first of all i guess try to help the north koreans understand that hey look this really isn't about you we're only concerned about china here you know, Beijing is the real enemy. Uh, this is you know, the bipartisan consensus in Washington is everybody agrees that war with China is good. Uh, you know, even uh, Vivek, he was saying that we, we can't go to war with Russia, but with China, then we're, we're going to agree to defend Taiwan and all this other ridiculous, uh, you know, ideas that he has planned for, for a potential future war with China. And, and so there, there's bipartisan consensus for war with China, but we're really not talking about war on the Korean Peninsula. And also to try to understand from the Korean perspective, uh, North Korean perspective, what it's like to have all these military, American military assets in the region and what the U.S., what steps the U.S. and South Korea could take to alleviate at least some of North Korea's concerns. And look, I, I'm not saying that this is going to solve the problem or bring an end to the Korean War, but at least, you know, it, I'm just saying from the perspective of Washington, the White House, if you're looking at the globe right now, you, I would think that you would really want to reduce tensions somewhere on the map, right? Like we're, we're picking fights with Iran and with, you know, potentially uh, Niger and West Africa, uh, of course, Ukraine, Taiwan, China, um, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, all these Syria, Yemen, all these countries are heavily sanctioned. Somalia, uh, and, and regularly, uh, you know, come under American airstrikes and things like that. And so this would seem to be a place where the, the Americans could maybe reduce tension and that would allow them to ship focus on to the, the you know great power conf confrontation with Russia and China. And again, I'm not necessarily advocating for that policy. I'm just saying I think a sensible thing for Washington to do by the foreign policy that they explicitly say that they hope to achieve, which is, you know, focusing on their great power rivals of Russia and China, it would seem very smart to, to want to try to reduce tensions, particularly with Kim Jong-un and, and Pyongyang. And yet it doesn't seem that there's anybody in the White House who recognizes that, that these issues are all kind of linked together, that the military buildup in the Indo-Pacific and intentions with Pyongyang or cares to do anything about it. And so it is is just unbelievably frustrating. All right. One more story here today before we wrap up. Uh, we, I, I've written a little bit more this week than I usually do on Middle East news, although this particular story I have here is by Dave DeCamp. But as always, me and Connor will be covering Middle East news on Friday's show. So more, more Middle East news to come. That's what I'm saying. But I thought that this one story should maybe be set off on its own just because it is so important and is something that... I've been writing about, although, again, this particular story is by uh, my colleague at Antiwar.com, Dave DeCamp. Uh, Dave writes here, U.S. news, Saudis were slaughtering African migrants at the border with Yemen, but kept it quiet. 
The Biden administration has been aware since last year that Saudi border guards were slaughtering African migrants on the Saudi Arabian border with Yemen, but kept it quiet about the killings, the New York Times report on Saturday. Sources told the Times that American diplomats were aware of the news last fall around the time the U.S. was publicly condemning Riyadh for agreeing to OPEP plus oil production cuts, but the administration did not make any public comments about the reported killings. And so again, th- this is this is this is unreal. Okay, so you have the Biden administration here. The the Biden administration officials who made the the you know policy of migration, immigration one of their top moral concerns. And I get that our border here is different from the Yemeni border. But at the same time, if you're saying that migrants have rights, migrants had to be treated like people and all this other stuff, and you're condemning a country for oil production cuts when you're also screaming about the consequences of climate change driven by fossil fuel, and then at the same time not condemn that same country for murdering women and children from Ethiopia who are simply uh, trying to move to a less worn torn country it is it, it's it, it sounds untrue to just try to explain this it sounds like I have to be making this up but again this is the, the what the New York Times reported happened and so it's absolutely astounding. And I think it shows that the, you know, Biden administration, uh, the, the people who voted for him, I'm not saying are like this, but the Democrat politicians, the, the Democratic you know, officials who now hold posts in, in the White House don't care about migrants. No matter what they say, no matter how much they try to s- slam and smear other people for not caring about migrants, they, they simply don't either. And so, look, you, you know, the, I guess the other thing to mention here is, of course, they knew. I knew, right? So uh, Human Rights Watch has released reports that I've covered. Uh, The Mitz Migration Center has released reports that I have covered. Uh, This has been talked about for some time that that this was going on. And so, again, it it shouldn't have come to a a surprise to anyone. Uh, But, you know, the real shocking thing is that the White House knew and and really just did not only didn't care but they cared more about Saudi Arabia cutting oil production than they cared about Saudi Arabia murdering migrants. It's, it's so shocking. And again, you know, th- these aren't like potential criminals. A lot of these people are easily identified women and children who Saudi Arabia is using explosives uh, to blow up. Or, you know, they'll go up to them and they'll say, all right, I'll shoot you in an arm or a leg. Which one do you want? These, these are the kind of sit people that the U.S. is, again, training and helping uh, as well as a part of our aid to Riyadh. So absolutely disgusting uh, what they're doing. All right, everybody. uh, Thank you so much for tuning back into the show. I'll be back uh, with, again, another show on Friday. Connor Freeman will be coming back. We'll toss some Middle East news and uh, update the war in Russia and Ukraine. Thanks.